I'm right here in the hall closet. No, no, my God. I have a look. As I was doing the um, IF alignment on this Zenith 90 21 chassis, I began to think about what it was I was really doing and why I was doing it. And so I would, thought I would spend some time on this video, which will be, be too long, sorry, they all are, talking about uh, IF cans, talking about what's going on inside those IF cans and why we're doing what we're doing when we do uh, an alignment, an AM alignment in particular. What we have here are a couple of IF transformers out of, I think these are out of a, a RCA uh, miniature tube radio. Um, yeah, they are. Um, they are both IF transformers uh, but they do have a different serial number. This one is 3902, ends with 3902. This one ends with 3901. Uh, but let's take a look. They're good representations of IF transformers as used in all superhead. All? Yeah, probably. All superhead radios. Certainly the old ones that we look at. If I pull this out. What we have here is... Uh, a phenolic tube and around which two coils are wound. Um, anytime there are two coils in close proximity you have a transformer because when this coil is energized, this happens to be the primary in this case, when this coil is energized it creates a magnetic field around itself that energizes this coil so that whatever signal is going on in this coil it's going on in this coil just 180 degrees out of phase. So if this coil, the, the AC voltage is going up, on this side it's going down, and vice versa. Um, the reason I say this is a primary is because to my eye, this coil is slightly smaller than this one. They're about the same width, but they're not they're the same with this way, but they're not the same with this way. The wire looks like the same gauge, um, so I'm, I'm calling it the primary, that's the secondary. And I suspect the reason for this part number difference right here, this O2, is that this one is a step up IF transformer. And in other words, as the IF signal 455 comes into this transformer, this coil here, it actually creates a higher voltage signal in the secondary. So you get a little bit of amplification, voltage amplification, uh, by, by doing that. I would guess, let me see if I can get this apart, that this one is not that way, that they're both the same size. Hmm. Hard to tell. Well, one way we can tell is to measure the impedance, the DC resistance of the wires, which we'll do right now. <coughs> so on the first one, we've got These are really fine. A wire coming from the inside of this coil to this pin. So the other side has to be either this pin, which is not, it goes up here, or it has to be this pin, which it is. So the, boat, the ends of this bottom coil attach to this pin right here and to this pin right here. So we'll check um, the DC resistance of that pair of pins. And that gives us 
17.5 ohms DC resistance. So I'll say on my notes here, the primary is 17.5 ohms. Now if I'm right and the other one is a secondary, it will have a higher DC resistance than the first one because it will have more winds. And fortunately I'm correct, it's 29.9 ohms for the secondary. Now not all IF transformers amplify. As I said, I suspect this one, oh, let's just check it right now. I suspect that one uh, has nearly the same impedance on both windings, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Let's see what is that? There's one. Here's the other. So, here are the two um, for the bottom co coil on this one, the nine thirty nine zero one. It's twenty two ohms even. Twenty-one point eight, and the secondary twenty-three point six. So close enough. This is on the 3901. <coughs> okay, so this is an IF transformer that doesn't amplify. The first one we looked at does amplify. <coughs> Pardon me. So I'll put that back in there and we can set this aside. can move this. One other component you can't see in this uh, transformer is lies right in here. There's a seam. There, this base is a piece of H shaped from from the camera's direction. Piece of plastic with another piece of plastic right there. And sandwiched between those two are two metal plates. One is connected to this pin, the other is connected to this pin, and they go across. This one comes up, for example, would come up here, go across and in that direction, but not touch this pin. This one will have a plate that's coming up this way, but does not touch this pin, and in between them is some dielectric material. It can be mica, it could be plastic, it could be a number of, of uh, materials. It's probably Given this was a 50s radio, mid 50s, it's probably still mica. Um, what those two plates create is a capacitor. So what we have is a tuned circuit here. We have a coil, we have uh, up here, the primary, it's connected to these two pins and in parallel with that coil, we have a capacitor built into the base of the transformer, of the IF transformer. And that creates a tank circuit, a resonance circuit. A coil, uh, a coil, an inductor, and a capacitor in parallel will create a tank circuit, a resonance circuit. And what that means is that these two want to vibrate together. They want to be in resonance together and they will oscillate back and forth um, at, a, at a, a certain frequency range. If you want to change the resonant frequency of a tank circuit, a resonant circuit like this, you can either change the capacitance 
uh, of the capacitor that's in here in the base or you can change the inductance of the uh, of the uh, coil itself and the way that we're changing when we adjust a radio with a tool sort of like this what we're reaching down in here and turning a thing so let me turn that thing all the way out so you can see what it really is and here it is it's a powdered metal powdered iron um, slug they're called um, it's powder and epoxy or powder and some other binding agent like that iron and it goes right down inside in this case there are two of these in here one sits right there in the tube so it's at the core of the secondary another one which I can still don't go away which I can still feel down in here sits at the core in in the same position right here sits at the core of the primary and when you adjust these so they go more toward the more of it's in the middle or less of it's in the middle of the coil you're changing the impedance or the um, you're changing the inductance of the coil by adjusting this in and out most often it will be pretty close to the center of that coil pretty close doesn't have to be exactly at the center. It won't end up being exactly at the center probably what you're doing when you do this is you're changing the resonant frequency of this coil and its uh, counterpart capacitor in the base so these guys are adjusted to 455 in this case 455 kilohertz when you adjust the slugs position inside this uh, secondary coil uh, to make this work best you need both of these the resonant frequency of this coil and its capacitor and this coil and its capacitor to be exactly the same frequency that way this coil can uh, trans transmit can induct the maximum amount of voltage into this coil and you get more out um, this one works the same way it just doesn't amplify as I said before um, but that's uh, fundamentally uh, an IF tank circuit an IF transformer it's it's uh, it's selecting and I'll show you a wave here in a minute or a diagram here in a minute it's selecting the best possible it allows you to select the best possible most efficient way to transfer 455 kilocycles from this coil to this coil so that these are both peaked that they're doing the working as hard as they can to uh, to uh, energize this one is working as hard as it can to energize this one and this one is working as hard as it can to pass the signal on to the rest of the circuit um, and that's an IF tank circuit right there Now what I'll do next is talk a bit about what what's going on in that tank circuit, what's going on between the coil and the capacitor. Um, this is kind of kind of the fundamental stuff you need to know if you're if you want to be knowledgeable about about what these guys are doing. So I'll do that next, and we'll do that on the computer. Here's a simplified version of half an IF can. Um, an IF can half of it consists of a capacitor non-polarized capacitor and a coil of wire the other half consists of another coil of wire here and another capacitor over here which are not showing uh, I just want to look at what happens in one half uh, of an RC, or, uh, an RC circuit and there are two RC circuits inside um, an IF cam so we have a capacitor it's non-polarized doesn't have a, a positive or a negative side it has a dielectric in between two plates and it can hold an electrical charge so let's put an electrical charge on there by hooking a battery across it like that batteries are devices that have a whole bunch of electrons on one side the negative side and a whole bunch of places for electrons on the positive side the holes you might call them 
Um, and when you hook a battery across a, an undischarged capacitor, electrons flow like crazy from the negative side, that's where an abundance of uh, electrons are, negative side down the wire at to this plate. At the same time that they're piling up, electrons are piling up on this plate, they're being sucked away from this plate by the positive side of the battery because it loves electrons and it will attract them. So whatever free electrons are sitting around on this side of the plate, they all get drawn over here and uh, into the battery. Uh, so now we have a charged capacitor. We have a capacitor that has a whole bunch of electrons on the lower plate and a whole bunch of non-existent electrons on the upper plate. Holes for electrons. Places electrons can fit. Now we'll take away the battery and the capacitor is charged. It has electrons? No electrons. So let's slide our coil over now and connect that. Now the coil from the bat from the uh, capacitor's perspective, the coil is just a piece of wire and it's shorting the two leads of the capacitor. What the capacitor wants to do is to have an even number of electrons on this side as on this side. It wants to be discharged. So it immediately starts discharging uh, electrons through this wire. When the electrons hit this coil, however, something interesting happens. The coil causes, well, first of all, let me say that any time an electron flow is going through a copper wire, it's creating a small magnetic field. When you wind the wire up into a coil, it's creating a much larger magnetic field. So the electrons go through here, they hit this, they slow down a little bit because some of their energy is being taken to generate a magnetic field around this coil. Finally, the number of electrons between here and here are balanced and the capacitor is discharged. But we have a big magnetic field around the coil. What the coil does is we can't sustain a magnetic field by itself. It needs electrons flowing through it. There are no electrons, therefore the coil collapses. But the interesting thing is when the coil collapses, it pushes electrons right on down the path. It creates electron flow uh, current through the coil and starts to pile up those electrons on the upper plate. And when the uh, coil has completely collapsed its magnetic field, a whole bunch of electrons have ended up on the upper plate and none on the bottom plate. And you can guess what happens next. Now we have a charged capacitor charged in the other direction. It has a whole bunch of electrons here and is missing a whole bunch down here. So it starts all over again. Electrons start flowing. As soon as they hit the coil, they start creating uh, a magnetic field around the coil and they go to this plate until they've discharged itself. Then the coil collapses, piles a bunch more electrons back on this side, and then we start right back where we were over here. Oops, not there. There. And it goes back the other way. Now the frequency at which this goes back and forth, it's kind of like a pendulum. The frequency at which this goes back and forth depends on the values of the coil and of the capacitor. The capacitor in farads, the coil in henrys. Um, you can select these values so that this oscillation back and forth like that uh, can go on at a specific frequency. Um, in our, I, our uh, IF can, what we want it to do is oscillate back and forth like this at 455 kilohertz. So what we do is we put a slug, a powdered iron slug inside this coil and we change its impedance or its uh, 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 inductance so that we can adjust the values of these two components so that they oscillate perfectly at 455 kilohertz. Now it's not to say that they'll oscillate forever, they will not. Uh, they'll run out of energy uh, because there, there's resistance in, in all these wires. Uh, so you have to add a little bit of signal either across the capacitor. You can add a AC or a varying DC signal and that will get it uh, at the right frequency and that will keep the thing oscillating. You can also uh, put the other half of the 
uh, IF cannon here, which puts another coil right here, and feed the signal into that, and that will induce uh, the signal here, and it'll keep oscillating. So this, and it's imagine its other half right here, need to be tuned to exactly the same frequency. Otherwise, it won't enough. There won't be enough energy transferred from this side to this side, the imaginary side, uh, to cause the signal to continue oscillating. That's why each side of the IAF can, each half of the IF transformer, needs to be tuned precisely to 455 kilohertz. And that's an overview of an RC circuit. So here is half the schematic of the Zenith 9E21. I've got the uh, AM um, signal path marked out here. Uh, green, those traces in green that you see here are where the RF signal comes in, gets amplified. And then at the converter, that RF signal is converted to 455 kilohertz and starts to go through the, this is the very first IF transformer is right here. Now one thing I didn't say uh, a minute ago was if the other you want to get the maximum energy transferred from this LC circuit to this LC circuit um, and these have to be on 455 the reason is there is an oscillator right here the uh, broadcast oscillator is oscillating at the RF signal frequency, this one, plus 455 kilohertz. So that what comes out of the converter is 455 kilohertz. If both sides of this thing aren't tuned to 450, oops, sorry, if both sides of this thing aren't tuned to 455 kilohertz, uh, you won't get uh, very much radio information through the rest of the schematic. Uh, but what I want to do here is talk about the number of times we see an uh, LC uh, circuit in a radio. Uh, this radio is is kind of upscale for its day. It has a lot more than than a than an All American Five will probably have, but that's okay. Let's start here. Uh, mm, let's start with the uh, the um, the broadcast oscillator. There's our coil. There's our uh, capacitor. In our in this case. That arrow and dashed line indicates it's one of the tuning capacitors, uh, air capacitor, air gap capacitor, and then there's a trimmer right here. So what this does is you can change, when you change the dial on the front of the radio, you're changing the capacitance of the, uh, the air gap capacitor and you're changing the frequency, but the, the um, inductance of the coil in Henry's and the combined capacitance of these two, both the, the uh, main tuning cap, uh, oscillator cap, and its trimmer, uh, are uh, combined to oscillate so that this LC circuit oscillates at the RF frequency plus 455 kilohertz. Um, we see another one right here where we've got RF being amplified through the RF amplifier comes down through here and hits this coil right here. It's magnetically coupled to this transformer with its own uh, RC or uh, R, uh, with its own uh, air gap capacitor and trimmer right here plus another capacitor. But this one tunes it to the to the RF signal only. Uh, so somewhere between the 88, what is it, 88 and 104, something like that. Somewhere in there, this coil and this coil and associated capacitors will be tuned to the appropriate radio station that you want to pick up in the first place. What did I say? I said FM. Uh, this is AM. Um, anyway, it'll be tuned to the, the appropriate AM station. And that signal gets picked up and sent on through the... Um, through this switch into the first the converter where it mixes it with the uh, oscillator and out the top of the converter comes our 455 kilohertz with an AM broadcast signal sitting on top of it. The audio is sitting there and it's modulating the 455 kilohertz signal. 
So that goes down through here, goes through uh, another uh, capacitor and ductor pair, LC network, gets magnetically coupled to another LC network. So how many have we seen here just for the AM path? And this is one too, I'll talk about that in a second. But we see one right here, we see one here, um, we see one down here for sure. We see one over here. This pair is our first IF uh, transformer. Here's the other half of the first IF transformer. It goes on over and uh, onto, the, onto the next schematic, which we'll look at right now. Here's the right half of the um, schematic. The uh, 455 kilohertz IF signal comes into the second IF amp. Uh, out here and down through this LC circuit, magnetically coupled to this one, out through the, uh, or the, this is the first IF amp, second IF amp is here, um, same thing, through this LC circuit, coupled to this one. Here the signal takes a, a, a route, this is the third IF can by the way, um, part of it goes down here along here and into the diode that's part of this uh, half of the 68 that's a triode. What it does is clip off the bottom half of the uh, 455, rectifies it, converts it into uh, audio only. Uh, the other side it contains the audio information, goes down through here through the switch, through another switch, back up here and over through the filtering uh, stuff and into the volume pot right here and then into the um, the control grid of the 68 which is the first audio amplifier and then on to the uh, to the output amplifier right here and onto the speaker so same thing we've got 455 kilohertz here we've got 455 kilohertz here here and here those all have to be able to oscillate at 455 kilohertz. Otherwise, we don't get a good strong signal into the uh, output of our radio. To the left-hand side of the schematic, I m remarked that there was uh, an LC circuit right here, and there is. It doesn't look like this one, where we have a coil and uh, capacitors in parallel with the coil. This one has a coil the signal, the RF, the radio station signal, comes through the 0.05 microfarad cap and drops through this coil and then runs into these three capacitors that are in parallel and goes to ground. This is a band pass filter and you will also notice that it's tuned um, with, the, um, with the same uh, gang tuning uh, air, air gap condensers that are sitting on top of the radio. This is the third one in the bunch, or the first one, depending on how you think about it. Um, the other one go to the the um, first IF or RF, the output of the first RF amplifier, and the other one is in turns our uh, broadcast oscillator here. What this one does is a bandpass filter. There are a number of ways of orienting uh, the relationship between a coil and uh, capacitors. And this one is the one that allows uh, a certain number of frequencies to come into the radio. It's not filtered them down to the one frequency you're listening to yet. That happens right here. But it is filtering, it, filtering out a lot of other stuff you don't want to hear about. You don't want to hear, rather. Um, so this is a bandpass filter. It's still another use for a, a, a LC circuit that you'll run into. Okay, that's enough for this time. I've blathered on all I care to, probably more than you've stuck with me, but if you have, thank you. I uh, hope you find this interesting. Um, anyway, that's it. Take care. See you next time.